Welcome back to Have You Swallowed the Hook? A 21st century challenge to the 19th century worldview of evolution. My name is Thomas Bentley, and in this episode, number five, we will tell, we'll look at the, what they tell you, love is just a chemical impulse. We're going to look at the evolutionist worldview of love and compare that to what we find in creation here tonight and the moral impact of both. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we delve into this study on these two worldviews, the worldview of evolutionism and its version of love and the Bible and the revealed love of the Creator God for us, I pray that you would be with us and help us understand these important things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here's the hook in number five. The hook says, love is just a chemical impulse. You're a mechanism, and love is just one of those mechanisms in the evolutionary worldview. Let's take a look at where all that came from. And to start with, we have to talk about philosophy, human philosophy. Human philosophy is man's attempt to explain what he sees in the world based upon human reasoning and man's desires, human desires. That's really what philosophy is. It's human wisdom based on human reason and human desires. And the ancient uh, philosophers have already had notions of what love is. In their, in their human nature and their human desires, they came up with a couple of ideas for love. In fact, we have words for them that are very popular in our world today. Uh, when you, from Simon Blackburn, Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy, we read this. And the first of the Greek notions of love is this notion of eros. And certainly the idea of eros is related to what provides pleasure pleasure for you. For example, it's used most often to talk about the pleasure of sexual love. But Plato added that, he elevated it a little bit to talk about the love that you have from the beauty of a plant or from a beauty of a painting or the pleasure that you get from succeeding. There are lots of different things. The pleasure of wisdom, you know, that was all called eros. And so the first kind of notion of love from the ancient Greek philosophers was this idea of eros kind of love, which essentially is what provides you with pleasure. It's whatever it is that provides you with pleasure could be called eros. Now, there was another one, a uh, popular Greek word that was used, and it was the word philea. And philea talked about a different kind of love. It was the kind of love that was a bond of comfort that people experience, like, for example, families, uh, or like men at war. They are bonded together by their circumstances, and as a result, there's this bond of comfort. And what you would call this would be reciprocal love. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, and that's the kind of love that we're referring to when we talk about evolutionist kinds of, or excuse me, Greek philosophy's kind of love. Now, the reason I said that was because, guess what? Fast forward to the age of evolutionism, and today, evolutionists are trying to explain to us what love is. And I found this article in Psychology Today, it was called The Evolution of Love by Rick Hansen, PhD, who was a neuropsychologist and this was February 15th, 2010. And in this article, as I was reading it, he, you know, he talked about, well, love is kind of complicated, this and that. But you know what he did? He essentially funneled it down to two basic things. Are you ready? Here's the first one. He funneled it down to a chemical that your brain makes called dopamine. And dopamine essentially is the arrows kind of love. Look at this. He says, in effect, being in love rewards the pleasure centers of your brain, which then crave whatever it was that was so rewarding. In other words, your beloved. Those reward centers are the same ones that light up when people win the lottery or use cocaine. And so what did he just do? He just took the ancient Greek philosopher's view of love, eros, whatever it is that provides me with pleasure, and he attached a chemical to it. 
you see? Now let's check the other one out. The next one in the article they talked about was oxytocin. And this is the philea kind of love. He says, oxytocin promotes bonding between mothers and children, between mates, so that they can work together to keep those kids alive. And also, he says, it's responsible for the friendliness that people have in times of stress or when people need each other for reciprocal support. So in other words, what this evolutionist has done is essentially taken Greek philosophy, Greek philosophical notions of love, and attached chemicals to them. Now, I hope by now, if you've been with me in this series, you realize that what he is doing is he's using naturalistic philosophy, atheism, to apply a materialistic explanation to explain love. That's simply all he's doing. He's taking Greek philosophical notions of love and he's applying them to chemicals that your brain uses. And so what's the result? Love is just a chemical impulse. You are simply a mechanism. And when you love, it's just you seeking pleasure or you having someone scratch your back and now you're gonna scratch theirs. That's all it is. You're just a mechanism and that's all love is. You know, it reminds me of a cartoon where it says how singers become self-centered. They sit, they sit there and they practice. They go, me, 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 right? You've heard that, right? And this is the bottom line. In the evolutionist worldview, it's all about me. It's the most, self-love essentially is all self-love. It's all selfish love. It's all about who scratches my back or I scratch theirs. It's all about if, what can provide me with pleasure. And guess what? In the evolutionist worldview, this is just normal and natural because you're a mechanism. And those two chemicals force you to do what you do. Oh, dopamine, love, pleasure, oh, oxytocin, bond of comfort. So all it is is that you're simply considered a mechanism. And this is what happens. But you know, the Bible talks about the days that we're living in when people have this kind of love. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. It says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Ooh, avoid such as these. This is gonna be something you will see even in Christianity where evolution's worldview of love is now our worldview. It's all about what provides me with pleasure. It's all about who scratches my back and I scratch their back. This is the evolutionist worldview of love. And let me talk to you about the moral impact of that. Uh, I was reading Time Magazine re recently, and Time Magazine, friends, basically is a mirror of the American culture. If you want to know what the American culture is like, read that magazine. And in it, one day I was reading it, and I saw this article about Breaking Bad, and I thought, I wonder what that is. What's Breaking Bad? So I read the article, and it turns out that there was a television series that was produced called Breaking Bad. And in it, there was a man, his name was Walter White, if I have that right. And Walter White was a upstanding citizen, a chemist in his profession, and all of a sudden his wife gets cancer. And so Walter White then uh, breaks bad. He starts cooking meth, and he begins to sell that meth, and of course, what he, he, to make money. Now, I want to share with you, as a pastor, I have led two people to Jesus. I've actually baptized two people who were addicted to methamphetamines. And I will tell you that that is one of the most destructive drugs that I've ever seen on a person's body. These people, they were, even though they were younger, they looked years older. And, and they had no teeth. One lady had one tooth, literally left because of the effects of this drug. You know, cooking methamphetamine, selling methamphetamine is an evil thing because you're actually hurting other people and become addicted to this a horrendous drug. But yet here's this man, because he needed to have money for his wife who had cancer, he was now expressing his evolutionist love, seeking pleasure in getting that money for his wife by creating this horrid drug. And as he goes along, he forms bonds of comfort with fellow drug dealers, and he eventually expresses that love by murdering them. And, and you know, it goes on and on and on. At the very end of this article, it talks about how at the end, uh, Willard, uh, this guy basically was now rich. His wife was paid for, all this drugs or whatever was paid for. 
and he now wanted to be an upstanding, respectable guy. You know, he, he had to break bad in order to express, basically, his evolutionist kind of love. And now that he was done, he was going to be, you know, the richer people or the higher evolved, so he was now a richer person. <laughs> and they, they were at the end of the movie, and they were, the series, and they were just, the whole article was talking about, what do we do with this guy? Do they kill him off? Do they reward him? I mean, but you know what? That's not the right question. See, what's happening here in our world is that breaking bad has become the new normal because in the evolutionist worldview, love is a mechanism. And love is simply seeking that which provides you pleasure. It's simply looking for those people to scratch your back and you scratch their backs. Love in our world now is the, the new normal is this idea of breaking bad. And we see it in our politics. We see it in our, our leaders in our country. We see it everywhere where people, to express that evolutionist love, which they claim we're just a mechanism and it's all we're doing, bouncing around here and there, seeking our pleasure, bouncing around here and there, looking for that bonds of comfort. It doesn't matter what you do to people because we're just scratching our way to the top of the heap. This is the new morals of evolution, the evolutionist view of love. So this is the world we have. A world where people express that love. They're taught that love. They see that love. And of course, we see it in the high crime rates and the kind of world that we're living in today. But fortunately, friends, there's another model. There is the worldview of creation. And in the worldview of creation, there's another Greek word that has been used throughout history to describe a different kind of love. A kind of love that was originally intended for all of the creation that we're living in. And that word is the word agape. Agape is a very little used Greek word that has its meaning basically only through the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. And the word agape can best be described as a love that is other-centered love. It's love that focuses not on me, but on you. Let's take a look at that for a minute. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, it says something amazing. It says, God is love. In, in the original language, it's ho theos agape estin. Basically, it says, the God, he is the love. God is this kind of love, this other person focused love. Let me share with you what the Bible says about it. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8 gives us an idea. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no wrong, record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always believes, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. Can you see a difference between the evolutionist worldview of love and the agape worldview of love, the creation worldview of love. Now, just look at God now in a new way. Think about this. This is the attributes of God. God is patient to you. God is kind to you. God does not envy you. God does not boast. God is not proud. God is not rude. God is not self-seeking. God is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrong. God is, does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. God always protects. God always believes. God always hopes. God always preserves. God never fails. Think about this as a description of the creator God who made you. And maybe you can learn about God for the first time in your life. And one of the things about this agape love, this creation love, this God of love that we need to understand is that the God who created us is extremely concerned about relationships. You can see it in everything we found out so far about love. God is concerned about relationships. And I'd like to talk to you about that for a moment because it makes a big difference. Let's talk about the idea of creation love, and human relationships. In the book of Genesis, God created us originally in his image, different from all the other animals. He created us with the ability to choose as he can choose, to reason as he can reason, and to create just as he can create. And in a world like that, you have to set some boundaries, right? And if God, who is our creator, has the rights to set the boundaries on his creation, you might think of it in a sense like uh, a game. Anybody who's ever played a game knows that there are boundaries in which the game plays. There's the rules of the game. And if you do not have any rules, there is no game. Isn't that right? 
very quickly that you realize everybody goes home because they say, wait a minute, this is no fun. We're not doing anything here. And so we all recognize the fact that boundaries, and some people that play the game don't see them as boundaries, they see them as pathways to good sportsmanship, pathways to the way to live. And this is the way you should see the kind of boundaries God set for us. And where those boundaries were originally recorded or written down, I believe they were there at creation, is at a time in Exodus where God gave to a man named Moses 10 commandments. And I'm going I'm to ask you a question. If you know what these Ten Commandments are, think about this for a minute. Are these commandments that talk about other person-focused love? Well, I will share with you that they are. There are four of them that talk about how we can practice other person-focused love with God, and there are six of them on how we can practice that with one another. Think about it. The first one was, you shall have no other gods before me. If I really love God, I won't place my car or my money or my bank account or some or statue or image in front of God. I won't do that. Uh, the second one says, you shall not make for yourself any graven image of anything that's in heaven above or on the earth or beneath the earth. Because guess what? When you do that, that's how you show me that you actually hate me. You know, when you, when you make a statue of a woman and you light candles to her or pray to her, or you take a, an image that you claim is God and eat it, basically you're making images that show God that you hate him. That's not how you should show God you love him. Uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This is another example of how we as children of God uh, misrepresent our own creator when we practice self-centered love and we take his name in vain or when we use his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Why? Because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters, we understand this, friends, that if we really want to practice love for God, if we want to practice this, self, this love that's not self-centered, but rather other person-focused love, we will actually honor our Creator by resting on that seventh day, worshiping on that seventh day, which, of course, is Saturday. How about these six, last six? Thou shalt love, you know, honor your father and mother. These, think about all these commandments. If I truly love you, will I kill you? If I truly love my wife, will I cheat on her? And so on and so on. And when you get to the New Testament, it's exactly the same. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 11, it says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. This is the law of the other person-focused love. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not do no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. I hope you're seeing this here, that the creation love of God, the love that God is, the love that God set as the boundaries for His society, for all that He created for us, is a love that is other person focused love. It is the fulfillment of that Ten Commandment law, which shows us how we can love God and how we can love one another. You know, it, Jesus told us also that this law is not just one that has rules that are boundaries. It is one that is spiritual, that is in your heart. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery in Matthew 5, 27 and 28. And then he follows that up by saying this, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so we can see that as people are living with these rules of love, some of them see them as pathways to good citizenship. In other words, they're being good sports. They see them in their heart. They understand that, the, that really where it begins is in your heart, where you formulate these ideas on how you're going to treat one another. And so this is the idea of this agape love. You know, many people are confused about this love, but guess what? This love, which God is, is actually reflected in this Ten Commandment law, where it says that God is holy or good or perfect or pure or just or true or spiritual or righteous, unchangeable or eternal. It says all of those same things about this law of love. God set it in place to ref for us to help us know how to practice this other person-focused love in his creation. Uh, some people say, well, isn't that the Moses' law? Well, there's actually a great big difference here because 
Moses' law was called the law of Moses, but God's law was called the law of the Lord. Moses' law was con a law contained in ordinances, while God's law was called the royal law. Moses' law was written in a book. God's law was written on stone. Moses' law was placed outside the ark. God's law was placed inside the ark. Moses' law ended at the cross, while God's law will stand forever. And that's a pretty good thing. So for the eternities, this kind of love is the kind of love we'll experience. Moses' law was added because of sin. God's law points out what sin is. Moses' law was contrary to us, against us. God's law was not grievous to us. Moses' law was carnal, it says in Hebrews. God's law was spiritual, it says in Romans. Moses' law made nothing perfect. God's law makes everything perfect. And love really is perfection, isn't it? And here's the last one. Moses' law judges no one, but God's law judges all people. And so now that we know what the standards are for, for the creation that God set up, it was not self-centered love. It was other person-focused love. We now need to understand about how we're going to be judged by that very law. Let's talk for a minute about agape and justice for just a moment. It says in James 2, 10 and 11, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. You see, the Creator God who made us and set these rules in place also has these rules as a way of judging. Did you actually play by the rules? Did you play the game right? In fact, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. One day we will be judged by basically this law will be a reflection of our lives. Did we practice other person-focused love? Or was all of our love just the evolutionist style, just the self-centered love, just what causes me to have pleasure? Is it only just about me? That's going to be the judgment. Did you follow this? And of course, the, the word for that is justice. And let me explain what I mean by that. You know, imagine for a moment that we lived in the town of Johnston. And, and Johnston was a town, there were the, the, the mayor put a little motto there, it says, a town that loves people. Now imagine that the mayor of Johnston just got elected and the people are wondering what kind of mayor she is going to be. And as soon as she gets in office, she begins to turn her back on crime. She just turns her back on it. She says, you know, we love people. We don't need to have a police station. We love people. We don't need to have uh, jail. Don't worry about it. And pretty soon, the people in Johnston are wondering what's happening. Uh, people are racing through the streets at high speeds. A, a child was almost killed. Someone broke into the neighbor's house. There's murder happening up the street. And the people are reading about this in the paper, and they're going, wow. How can we say that Johnson is a town that loves people? And I think all of us recognize that there really can be no love unless there is justice. And God really cares about relationships. He cares when something happens to you. He cares when someone murders that other person. And as a result, there has to be justice. Part of love is justice. And this is exactly what God said about himself to Moses. Listen to what he says in Exodus 34, verses 4 to 7. It says, So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to the Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed. Now here's the Lord going to proclaim about himself here. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. You see, the character of love has two qualities, mercy and justice. God really does care about relationships. He cares what happens to you. And as a result, there is justice that we find in the law. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, whoever committeth sin 
transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And what this is saying is that that moral law of love, this boundary code that God had given for his creation, when we break that, when we decide to practice self-centered love and we hurt another person, we're transgressing that and that's called sin. Matter of fact, um, let's take a look at that concept for just a moment. You know, sin really always talks about our unwillingness to keep this moral law of love, to love people with other person-focused love. For example, one of the words for sin is simply that you're incapable of doing it. You're incapable of loving someone as you, you basically this other person-centered love. Another word is transgression. Transgression can best be described as rebellion. This is where you actually are saying, I don't care, I want to do it my way. That's the, basically all of evolution and atheism today. It's transgression. And finally, another word that they use in the Bible is the word iniquity. Iniquity is like when you throw a, 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 a rock, it hits the window, the window breaks, and everyone suddenly turns and stares at you. That guilt that you have, that's the idea behind iniquity. And of course, one of the things we know from the scriptures, and I think you probably know yourself by now, is that what it says in Romans 3.23, and that is that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have failed to practice this other person focused love, this creation love that God has given to us. And of course, the result of that is death. It says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. But I want to share with you that in the creation model, this was never to be so. In the creation model, if you look in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, and the last one, Revelation, you'll find something interesting. In both of those, there was this first prototype human beings in a uh, garden that, that was created specially for them, and in that garden, there was a tree of life. That same tree of life is seen in an earth made new with God's redeemed people. And once again, they have this eternal life. God, death really was a foreigner to the Bible. But between the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation, you have a history of humanity that sought only after self-seeking love, that rejected God's moral law. They rejected the kind of love that focuses on someone else. It's an entire history of our fall and downfall. And you might ask yourself, well, where in the world, how did this happen? How did these first two created beings actually get into this mess where they would choose to practice self-centered love over a relationship they had with their creator? Well, the answer can be found back in Genesis in something that, in a dialogue basically that happened between Eve and this serpent who was motivated by the, the uh, fallen angel Lucifer. Listen to what it says. This will give us an idea of how it all happens for us as well. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, it says, But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And here is the key, something that this fallen angel had discovered for himself, is that when you make yourself God, when you deify yourself, then it makes it possible for you to only love yourself and to reject this love that God had set in his creation, this love that God is, this other person-focused love. This is the bottom line. The first commandment that you break when you break them all is when you make yourself God. And this is exactly what's happened in our world today. I found an interesting article in CNN Belief Blog, and the article is this. It's, it's a study that happened by a, a professor in Concordia College and the title of it is, How Satanists See Death. And what this, uh, this person from Concordia College did was they were able to get into the higher echelons of the religion of Satanism, which started in San Francisco and now is centered in New York City. And when she was interviewing these very, very high-level atheists, she discovered the, basically the secret to their whole religion. And here's what it is. Quote, one of the main tenets of the faith is atheism, not just a disbelief in God, but also in the devil or Satan. Satanists believe God is an invention of man and instead deify themselves. This is the essence of how we get to this place where we have only self-centered love is when we choose 
to make ourselves God. We choose to reject the creator God who made us and instead elevate ourselves to the level of God. And that's what the basis of evolution is. Evolution is atheism. And so this is how we got to the place in our world today where we have nothing but self-centered love. In the Bible, God's justice was, was seen because when people only practice self-centered love, everyone gets hurt. Think about what happened in Genesis, a time when there were people on the earth were described this way. Genesis 6, 5, every intent of the thoughts of their heart was evil continually. The love had gotten to the place in this world where it was totally self-centered, never focused on anyone else. The thoughts of their hearts were evil continually. Can you imagine a population like that? Well, guess what? We're, we're moving in that direction today. And of course, because love involves justice, God destroyed that world, but saved a remnant, just eight people who still had a relationship with their creator, just eight. You move a little bit later to the time of Abraham, and there were cities in the plains, Sodom and Gomorrah, and God went down to see that the, that the devastation of self-centered love, self-seeking love, had done to this population of people. And it was so grotesque that God destroyed those cities. And the Bible says that that's a sign for us for what will happen at the end of time for all of us who practice this self-seeking love. But having said that, love, true love, revolves justice. Thank the Lord that true love involves also mercy. I'd like to talk to you about that for just a moment. Agape and atonement. You know, the word atonement that we find in the Bible is a word that gets all of its meaning from the Old Testament. It's really not found in the New Testament. And what it basically means is there has been a rift that has happened between two people, two parties. And one of those parties then makes a bridge to the other to make atonement, to bring those relationships back together. And ever since the fall of man, God had intended to do just that with us. See, fallen man, he has practiced self-centered love. He has broken those commandments. All of us have sinned, and therefore, how could we possibly build a rift to God? Isaiah 59 verse 2 says that it is our sins that separated us from God. And God in his mercy, in this other person-focused love, purpose to build a bridge to us, to restore our relationship, and that's called atonement. We see in the Bible images of that from the very beginning, where an innocent life was slain in worship to show what was going to happen. We look in the book of Exodus, where God told them to build a sanctuary patterned after something that is in heaven, a sanctuary that was the type to what was going to be the antitype in Christ. Look here where we see the sinner coming with his offering. He brings the offering and there confesses his sins, where he practiced self-centered love, hurt another person. So he puts the hand on there, confesses that sin, slays the animal, and the life, the blood of that innocent animal then atones for that sin. All through the year, people were doing this and, and the, inside that sanctuary, there was a holy place and a most holy place. One day of the year in that holy most holy place, something amazing happened where they were going to cleanse it. And inside there, you can see this incredible plan that God had intended for us, how he was going to build a bridge to restore us to himself. And there you'll see an Ark of the Covenant. This Ark was a box that was uh, covered with gold. And inside that box, there was this moral law of God, this law of other person-focused love. Above that, was the very presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God. And between the presence of a holy God and a broken law that all of us has broken was something called the mercy seat. It was a gold covering between the two and watching all of this were heavenly watchers, these witnesses, seeing the whole scene. And this, my friends, was telegraphing what God was going to do to build this bridge. Let's look at it in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 25. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. 
Friends, that word propitiation literally means mercy seat. Jesus Christ was that mercy seat. God sent his only begotten son that you could be saved, that he died in your place. He became your sin. He is the one whom now is the one who saves you. And so what we find is that God's mercy and God's justice in Jesus Christ meet at that cross. God in his justice has to deal with the fact that we have broken his law, that we have hurt other people because God really cares about relationships. That's what other person-focused love does. But God in his mercy placed all of that on his son Jesus, all of your sins, all of the times that you had broken and hurt another person. God has placed that on Jesus Christ. And he died in your place so that you could live. This is an amazing thing. This is why we have this text, John 3.16, is one of the most popular texts in the scripture. For it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him and what he did for you will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, Jesus Christ was that bridge that God had made for us that we could have a relationship with him again, that we could be restored to him again. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And here's the condemnation. Here, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. You know, friends, today we have two choices. You have the choice of practicing evolutionist love, just banging around in life, breaking bad, seeking whatever you can, or you have the opportunity to look at Jesus, to be restored by God, to have your sins forgiven, to come back and be united, atoned with God. The choice is yours. It's all a matter of your choices. Jesus built a bridge for you. Right now, I'm going to make an appeal that you come across it, that you accept what Jesus Christ has done for you. It'll change your life. And you know, this is, this is something I want to share with you, that there's one more aspect to love. See, God is a God who creates, and he wants to recreate in you love. He wants to restore in you this other person-focused love. And that's part of agape. You know, you think about the fact that a person who fundly sees the love of God, they suddenly understand their situation and they turn and accept Jesus. God wants to change their hearts. He wants to restore in them something new. And he can do that in you, friend. It says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see, this God who created us wants to recreate in us. He wants to put that moral law of love inside your heart, that you would have this ability to practice other person-focused love, that you could be restored back to the way it was, and you could have a relationship with God. You can have relationships with one another based not upon self-centered love, but other person-focused love. And this is the whole goal behind what God has planned for us. Think about it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. The mystery hidden from ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of glory and the mystery which is Christ in you. That you too can live as Christ lived. That you too can have the love that God has for you. That you too could express this other person focused love. This is the ideal. This is what God wants to do to you and for you. Friends, we've seen both of these models today. We've seen the evolutionist worldview of love and where that is taking our society. And I've shown you the creation model worldview of love. I've talked to you about what that love looks like, who that God is who loves you, and how that God is through his plan of salvation going to save you. But not just save you from the penalty of sin, but also restore you so that you too can live a life that practices other person-focused love. 
Is that a desire that you have today, friends? You know, I'm going to share with you that I'm, I'm speaking here today to people perhaps who are hearing this for the first time. They've, they've been going through this series. They've been realizing that this evolutionist worldview, this atheistic worldview, is not really science. It's not really what's happening in our world today. And now you've come to this place where you've learned about God and we're asking a question. Will you accept this creator God? Will you accept his salvation that he offers you so freely? I remember a story that I was told about a man and his two sons. They went out into the ocean in a nice place where there was a very hot day and the waters were nice and mild. And there his, this father looked at his two sons in the boat and they said, he said to his sons quite clearly, he says, sons, I want you to stay in the boat. Don't go in the water because there are sharks in this water and I know that they are here. So don't go in. So he goes down into the cabin to fix some lunch. And while the boys are out there on this hot day, well, you know what they were doing. They were playing and, and laughing and roughhousing it around. And one of the boys then took the other person's goggles and throws it out off the boat into the water. Well, you know, the other boy just immediately dashes into that water and he swims over to those goggles. He puts them on and then he looks around into the water and he says, well, I don't see any sharks. Hey, come on in. The water's fine. There's no sharks in here. Come on in. And so the two boys get into the water and they're playing and roughhousing around in the water. And pretty soon they have they had drifted away about 200 yards away from this boat. The father, finishing lunch, comes walking up onto the deck with a knife in his hands, looking for his two boys and shocked to see them out there in the water. He says, boys, come back into the boat. And they said, dad, you're just trying to scare us. But what the boys couldn't see that the father could see from his perspective were these dark shadows that were rolling around in the water beginning to enclose the area where these boys were playing. And he looked at the two boys and said, sharks are in the water. Come into the boat. And the two boys hesitated until finally one of the sharks crested and they saw the, the fin and they became scared. And the father looked at them at that moment and said, boys, when I jump in the water, I want you to swim to the boat as fast as you can. And he did something unthinkable. He slashed his wrists with that knife, blood gushing everywhere. He dives into the water in the opposite direction and swims as fast as he can. The boys rushed to the boat and by the time they got inside that boat of safety, they looked out into the water and all they could see was the water churning, the water and the blood. You see their father in love for them laid down his life so that they could be saved. Because these boys chose to practice self-centered love. The father in his love laid down his life so that they could be restored. And this, my friends, is what Jesus has done for you. God so loved you that he gave his only son that if you accept Jesus Christ, you can be saved. You can come out of a world of evolution love and out of a world of mechanism and self-centered love, smashing around your life, clawing to the top, and you can come back to a love that will change your life. Would you like to accept that today? You know, that, that blood is still in the water, friends, but I don't know for how long before Jesus will end his work of mediation for you and come again. So I'm asking you to make a decision today, a decision to choose Jesus Christ as your Savior, to choose your Creator, to come back to the love that you were intended for all your life, and friends, if you've made that decision today, I'd like you to write us here in Amazing Discoveries and let us know that you have made a decision that has changed your life forever because I'd like to hear about it. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for sharing with me in the scriptures this love, for helping us see the difference between the evolutionist worldview of love and the one that you had intended for us all along. I pray for those people today that are making decisions in their hearts right now to accept the kind of love that you had intended for us for eternity. Thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We have one more episode to go, friends, and then they tell us there are no miracles, so stay tuned for that one. And thank you so much, and God bless.
Thank <laughs> you.